Your Excellencies, colleagues and friends, as you know, last year the UN Secretary General called for a food system summit to unleash the power of food to drive progress across all 17 United Nations development goals. I thank you for stepping forward to become a leader for the food systems change. These dialogues bring together people from all parts of society to share evidence, experience and new ideas. Food is powerful. The food we eat brings us together as families, as communities and as nations. It underpins our culture, our economies and our relationship with the natural world. The world's food system touch every aspect of human existence, which makes them variable instruments of change. The reason we are having a summit this year and the reason we are here today is because we are off track. We are not set to achieve on our shared vision and goals for the 2030 Agenda. Our food systems have staggering levels of inequality. Our key priority for this summit is to bring more inclusive, equitable and healthier food systems while also safeguarding our planet. These dialogues are a core element of the summit process. They are an opportunity to come together and identify priorities and actions to be taken for a better future. This will be a people's summit, but it will also be a solution summit because everyone 
is part of the food system. We are looking to get all of you and your ideas around the table to ensure that action is owned and driven by different actors. We want action to be driven by you. Your leadership and the ability to have courageous conversations rather than avoid them will be very critical. If we can't have courageous conversations about what needs to change and how we need to work together, then we won't be able to go very far. We need each of you to determine the food system you want for your future and to act on it to make them a reality. We must do this understanding fully well our place in the world and that what we do as individuals impacts on others. I look forward to working with you in this summit process. Together, we can build a world of inclusive growth, environmental sustainability, and social justice. We can build a resilient world where no one is hungry, no one is poor, and no one is left behind. I thank you. And hello again. Welcome to the fourth and final in this series of national dialogues that are all part of the preparations for that United, United Nations Food System Summit this autumn. We've covered a lot of ground so far. Ireland's 2030 agri-food strategy, the health and well-being of food systems for consumers and producers and communities, the change being driven by young people and by groundbreaking research, and all in the context of meeting the challenge of the climate crisis. Well, today we're looking at what all of this means for Ireland's foreign policy in trade and development and in particular our relationship with African countries. Once again, we have two great panels. I'll tell you more about them in a bit. And today, not just one, but two fantastic keynote speakers. Dr. Susanna Moorhead from the OECD and Dr. Jamie Morrison from the Food and Agriculture Organisation. And we look forward to hearing from them shortly. And our chairperson for this afternoon's dialogue is Rory de Borca, the Director General of Irish Aid at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Throughout these dialogues, we've had great participation from you, our online audience, through Slido polls and the questions and comments you have sent us in all the panel discussions. And as Tom Arnold, who's with us again today, said in the very first dialogue, the aim of these discussions is not pushing consensus on people, but in fact, the very diversity of viewpoints that you have shared with us so far. And we hope to hear all that diversity again today. We're using Slido again, so please join our conversation online. Simply take out your smartphone and open your browser. Go to slido.com and enter our event code, hashtag food systems. And you can now ask questions and vote for the ones you like. We're starting with a quick poll. What sector are you joining us from today? Are you from the international development sector, the farming area, agri-food industry, university, research, or are you involved in civil society or an independent? Please let us know. And for more information on Ireland's food system and the UN Food Systems Summit this year, visit gov.ie forward slash food systems, where you can also register for uh, the upcoming dialogue. Now, the public consultation on the environmental assessment of the draft agri-food strategy 2030, that remains open until the 15th of June, and they want to hear from you. Go to gov.ie forward slash consultations to have your say. And we look forward to hearing from you this afternoon. To get our session underway, here's your chairperson, the Director General of Development, Cooperation and Africa Division at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Rory de Borca. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. This is the fourth and last Irish National Dialogue and we'll focus on aligning domestic and foreign policy towards sustainable food systems. As Anya said, I'm Rory de Burke, the Director General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Development Cooperation and Africa Division. I manage the Irish Aid Development Cooperation Programme. I'd like to thank Sinead McPhillips, convener of these dialogues, for asking me to be your chair today. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and insights on how Ireland can promote sustainable food systems worldwide and how we can translate policy into tangible outcomes. As those who attended previous dialogues know, these events are an integral part of Ireland's contribution to next September's UN Food Systems Summit. That summit will give life to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. It will help enable the sustainable transformation of our current frameworks for producing, processing and consuming food. Last year's UN State of Food Security Nutrition in the World Report 
estimated that almost 10% of the world's population were experiencing food insecurity. COVID-19, combined with climate change and conflict, as well as a plague of locusts, will, since that report was published, have increased food and nutrition insecurity for many millions more people. Sustained action is required now to address these specific challenges and to deliver transformative and enduring improvements across the global food system. This will require a focus on inclusive and sustainable economic growth, innovative food production, climate resilient agricultural practices and universal access to affordable and nutritious foods. Ireland's role in the establishment of the Food Systems Summit has been important. We were among the first to call for this high level event. We are providing support to extend its reach and its impact. We are working to ensure that there is strong engagement from key stakeholders within least developed countries and also from small island developing states. Ireland has a long established commitment to eradicate global hunger, to supporting the production of and access to sustainable and nutritious foods. This is a commitment born out of our own historical memory of famine. Ireland's international development policy, A Better World, restates this commitment. That policy seeks to refresh our engagement on food, hunger and nutrition. As we think about a sustainable food systems approach, we must consider the connections between economic, environmental and social systems with the production, consumption and distribution of food. The UN Food Systems Summit is an opportunity for Ireland to show leadership and to be a champion for, sustainable, for a sustainable approach to food. Our understanding of food systems and the role they can play in achieving the SDGs has grown over these three, last three dialogues. These events have allowed us to discuss and reflect upon the complexities, challenges and opportunities that will arise. We have heard how a sustainable food systems approach has informed the development of Ireland's 2030 agri-food strategy. We've heard of the changes needed to strengthen the health and social sustainability of our agri-food policy. And we've heard how innovation and inclusivity are the way forward. This final dialogue will focus on how Ireland's domestic and foreign policy work together to deliver sustainable food systems. I look forward to really insightful and thought-provoking observations on the challenges and opportunities facing those operating on the ground in developing countries and on how we can use our voice to encourage and promote actions that will support inclusivity, efficacy and sustainability. We will first hear a keynote address from the Chair of the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD, Dr Susanna Moorhead. Susanna has served as the British Ambassador to Ethiopia and Djibouti and UK Permanent Representative to the African Union and the UN Economic Commission for Africa. She has also served as the UK's Executive Director at the World Bank and held senior positions in the UK's former Department for International Development. In her address, Susanna will illustrate the challenges facing food systems and explain the importance of ensuring coherence across domestic and foreign policy. She will provide us with some thoughts on how Ireland can take action in responding to these challenges. Her second keynote address is from Dr Jamie Morrison, Director at the UN's Food and, Agricult food and Agricultural Organisation and a strategic programme leader for its food systems programme. Prior to joining FAO, Jamie was senior lecturer in agricultural economics at Imperial College London. In his address, Jamie will provide some context to the rising food and nutrition insecurity globally, further accelerated by the ongoing pandemic. He will also share perspectives on the process and possible outcomes for the upcoming summit, while drawing on learnings from recent FAO Ireland initiatives in East Africa. Following these, we will have two panel discussions moderated by RTE's Anya Lawler. The first will focus on how Ireland can show leadership across the multilateral system to promote sustainable food systems. The second will look at how we can move from policy to practice, examining the challenges and opportunities when working on the ground in developing countries to support food systems transformation. We have heard many voices and perspectives, sorry, we have many voices and perspectives to hear. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Dr. Susanna Moorhead for her keynote address. Thank you. Let me congratulate Ireland for organising this important event. Ireland's history means that you bring unique substance and credibility to international discussions about food security and food systems. And I hope that your example will be followed by other UN member states as we reflect on what we can all do to make food systems more sustainable, both domestically and internationally. 
It's almost impossible to overstate the importance of food systems in the context of sustainable development. And COVID, of course, has made global food insecurity even worse. Shockingly, over 2 billion people go to bed hungry every night or don't have diets that are sufficient for a healthy and happy life. Food production and consumption have massive impacts on the environment, on biodiversity, on the availability of water and on all aspects of climate change. Food systems, of course, have the potential to provide livelihoods, to generate jobs for poor people. So they're an integral part of trying to tackle poverty in poor countries. And last, but by no means least, in fragile and conflict affected states, food becomes often a weapon and another source of instability. So what can Ireland do to help tackle these challenges? Clearly, this is about foreign policy, domestic policy and development policy, and it's critical that all three work together to achieve the sustainable development goals. Ireland is a very important player in the international development architecture, a key member of the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD, of which I'm chair, and a generous donor providing over $970 million of official development assistance in 2020. As part of the DAC, what we do is to peer review each other, to hold members to account to the high standards and values that we set as a committee. And Ireland had a peer review uh, in 2020, um, and, and there were some really positive and important findings from that. Um, Ireland does a huge amount to live up to its promise of uh, focusing on, on the least developed countries and trying to leave no one behind. Ireland is a world leader in women's empowerment and gender equality and a staunch and, and generous champion of civil society organisations in the international development space. The peer review also identified some areas where Ireland could improve and particularly in terms of policy coherence for sustainable development. What, what do we mean by, by that? Um, I think in its simplest terms, it, it, it's firstly ensuring coherence across different policy areas. So, for example, if you're thinking about food and agricultural policy, that clearly has implications for the health of the population or, or indeed uh, the environment. The second dimension is policy coherence across generations. So policy choices that we make today are going to have implications for our children and our grandchildren and, and that is particularly critical in terms of the environment. And thirdly, policy coherence across the world. So the policy choices that we make domestically, whether in terms of tax or trade or migration or broader foreign policy, clearly have implications for other countries and particularly for developing countries. So really policy coherence for sustainable development is, is a is a rather fancy term for simply saying we need to reflect on the, the overall impact of the policy choices we make and of course the trade-offs and to do so in a way that maximizes the contribution we can make to achieving the SDGs across the world. Ireland is a really important voice in, in this space. Um, partly through your excellent diplomats, the role you play in multilateral organisations, but also the experience you have from your developing country programmes and, and projects. Um, I'm hoping that as part of, of these conversations that we're having today, that Ireland's voice will continue to be heard in the European Union, certainly in the Development Assistance Committee and elsewhere in the international system. Ireland has long been a loud champion of the, ad, of the fight against hunger um, and it's well placed to champion policies that underline its eradication, which surely is something that we ought to be able to do in 2021. Food systems are one of the three priorities of Ireland's development cooperation policy called A Better World. And through development cooperation, it's possible to build coalitions and generate valuable evidence to support the global changes required to wipe out hunger from the face of the earth.
Working with multilateral organisations is essential for this. And I would really like to thank the Food and Agricultural Organisation for its global leadership during this particularly challenging time for food security. I'd like to close by leaving you with four ideas for how Ireland could take this important agenda forward. First, please keep investing in agricultural research and development that benefits developing countries. This is investing in the future in ways that gives very, very important returns. Second, please share lessons about what works and what doesn't from your development partners and programmes. Thirdly, share your experience from citizens' assemblies on how to consult and debate difficult policy issues such as climate change. I think we have a lot to learn from your experience there. And last, but by no means least, explore ways in which Ireland can make its agricultural policies contribute to net zero. Let me finish there. Thank you very much for inviting me to, event, to address this important event, and I wish you every success in the deliberations over the course of this meeting. Goodbye. Susanna, thank you for those remarks. And before we go any further, let me tell you who you are joining us today. Uh, we asked you what sector you were joining us from. And from the international development sector, about a fifth, 22%. Farming, only 6%. We'd love to see more farmers tuning in today. Uh, the agri-food industry, 15% of you watching are from there. The biggest number are joining us from the university research sector and also around another fifth, 19% from civil society and independent. I'm going to give you another Slido question now, which will feed into our first panel discussion in a bit. Ireland has an historical experience of famine, which Susanna was talking about there. So, what types of game-changing solutions should Ireland therefore be focusing on at the Food Systems Summit? Is it empowerment and innovation for smallholder farmers? Universal social protection? The elimination of hunger? Improved low-carbon agri-food infrastructure? or conflict prevention and peace building. Let us know which one of those you think is most important. And now please welcome our next keynote speaker. As you've heard, he's Dr. Jamie Morrison, the Director of Food Systems and Food Safety Division at the Food and Agriculture Organisation. And Jamie is also a member of the Food Systems Summit Secretariat. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Anya, and good afternoon to all. Let me begin by elaborating on a couple of points that Susanna Moorhead made on the importance of food system transformation in accelerating process, progress towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. While some of the initial concerns about the potential disruptions to food availability as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic were alleviated through the maintenance of trade flows and food systems, transform and food systems functionality, the pandemic continues to bring into sharp focus the many areas in which food systems are not delivering on desired social outcomes. One of the starkest of the many challenges that we face is that even before the pandemic, 690 million people were suffering from hunger, a number that had already been increasing over the past few years and which has jumped sharply in the past 12 months. And this puts us even further behind our target of eliminating hunger by 2030. Of course, the drivers and patterns of inadequate food and nutrition security are complex, and they manifest in very different ways. The challenge of eliminating hunger often sits alongside the growing health concerns associated with increasing prevalence of overweight and obesity, and the reduced potential of the many millions more suffering the consequences of micronutrient deficiencies. But one of the many underlying factors that are constraining our ability to reverse these trends is the fact that 3 billion people are unable to afford a healthy diet. And this is particularly concerning. With the impacts of COVID continuing to reduce the impacts of the most vulnerable, affordability will increasingly constrain food choices. And by implication, this will hold back the required transformations of food systems. So how do we address the complex problems of ensuring that food systems deliver safe, nutritious and affordable food to all, but do so in a way that also drives greater equity in livelihoods and purchasing power and makes a positive contribution to the natural resource environment? 
And this is where the Food System Summit is so important. Through the national dialogues such as this one, which are now taking place in over 100 countries globally, the summit is providing a process whereby nations can provide can identify pathways to more sustainable food systems that are relevant to their particular challenges and capacities. Informed by the work of five summit action tracks, these dialogues will allow countries to develop and to commit to bold actions that they and their development partners will need to take if these pathways are to be successfully implemented. But of course, this involves working through many complex trade-offs and paradoxes. For example, how do we encourage changes in consumer behavior, which are needed to drive improvements in health outcomes and in the way in which food is produced, when such a large proportion of the global population is so heavily constrained in the choices that they can afford to make? Here, enhanced social protection programs will surely need to play a critical role. Equally, how do we square the importance of ensuring that mechanisms are in place to limit disruptions to global food trade in times of crisis, with the need to develop resilient local food systems that address issues of poor returns to producers and inadequate or unsafe diets, but which at the same time may imply restrictions on cheap food imports. Many of these challenges are not new and some countries have been navigating them successfully for decades. There is much to learn from these cases and to share with others as they develop their pathways to improve food systems. Ireland's journey has provided to be an invaluable source of inspiration for FAO's work on food systems. In early 2018, we joined colleagues from the African Union Commission and representatives from 11 countries across Africa to engage in a series of conversations with a range of public and private sector leaders in Dublin. Our African colleagues observed a unique coherence in approach and in vision, and that inspired ideas that they could then take back to their own countries. In fact, the learning exchange was so well received that the African Union Commission subsequently invited Irish representatives from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, Sustainable Food Systems Ireland, Board Beer, Gland Beer, the Smurfit Business School, and Irish Aid to travel to the African continent to continue this lesson sharing with events that were held in Rwanda and Uganda in 2019. At the same time, we've been working in collaboration with Wageningen and University um, to document such lessons so that this experience can be shared more widely and used as a source of inspiration for other countries. To list a few of these lessons, Ireland's success in linking science, research, extension, and education, and placing it at the core of systems transformation. Ireland's integrated approach has accelerated knowledge absorption, while also ensuring a continuous flow of high quality expertise to the food industry. The integrated approach has also strengthened linkages between education institutes, industry, and farmers. The benefits of the public-private origin green training partnerships are illustrative of this. And at FAO, we've been very fortunate to be the recipients of two origin green placements, Cleaner Conlon and Chevelle Bird, over the past few years. The long-standing priority that Ireland has placed on food safety and authenticity assurances has also been a critical transformational factor. The fact that the sector has been able to leverage its traceability mechanisms for tracking sustainability targets is commendable. And again, an important lesson that could be replicated in other countries. There are many other learnings that I could refer to, but I would like to end uh, this presentation by simply reiterating the invaluable source of inspiration that Ireland's journey continues to provide to many of us. We will continue to watch and to learn as Ireland navigates its way as a world leader in the production of sustainably produced, affordable and nutritious food, both for its domestic consumers, but importantly, for the global community. Thank you very much. And Jamie, our thanks to you.
And let me go straight ahead and introduce our first panel to you. Tom Arnold, former head of concern and currently amongst the many hats that Tom wears, uh, he Tom chairs Ireland's 2030 Agri-Food Food Strategy Committee. Michelle Winthrop joins us from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, where she's policy director in the Development Cooperation and Africa Division. Owen Devonish is the chairman of the Belfast-based Devonish Group, which exports to more than 50 countries. And Professor Charlie Spillane joins us remotely. He chairs the Irish Forum for International Agricultural Development. And now let's show our panel what you thought in answer to our second Slido poll. And this was based on our historical experience of famine. What kinds of game-changing solutions Ireland should be focusing on at the Food Systems Summit? Um, and pretty much <coughs> the big majority, 42%, excuse me, <clears throat> spoke about empowerment and innovation for smallholder farmers. Uh, universal social protection, only 7% said that was the most important. 10% uh, saying the elimination of hunger, the most important. Uh, our runner-up, if you like, uh, improved low-carbon agri-food infrastructure, and uh, that was 36% and only 4% uh, selecting conflict uh, prevention and peacemaking. And Tom Arnold, it's really interesting there, isn't it, that our view viewers joining us today, uh, they think that empowerment and innovation for smallholder farmers and also working on low carbon agri-food infrastructure. So given what we've heard in all the dialogues so far and what we're trying to do now in, if you like, lining up our trade policy and our development policy, so they're all basically singing off the same hymn sheet. Uh, would you agree with those as priorities for us going into the summit in the autumn? Well, yes. I mean, they're, they reflect a range of opinion. I mean, the, I think what it really says is that there is an acceptance now that working towards sustainable food systems is indeed the correct policy priority. I think it's very important, though, to say that hunger, which has been at the elimination of hunger, which has been at the centre of Irish policy over a long period of time, it remains of critical importance. Does it concern you that that's 10%? Is there a sense? Because I was struck by what Jamie was saying about even before the pandemic, nearly 700 million people were suffering from hunger. Three billion can't afford a healthy diet. Mm. You know, and we know that all of that has gotten worse since the that's pandemic right. and we're off the 2030 targets. Yeah. Is, is there a sense in which we're still not grasping how difficult a problem this is? I think I would prefer to see that 10% figure higher because I think it's fundamental to uh, achieving. I mean, even if you're going for promoting sustainable food systems, making sure that the people at the bottom of the pile, if you like, yeah. can ha meet their needs is, is crucially important. But I, I think the real point, and it's Jamie and Susanna reflected on it, is that this year is a crucially important moment to look at the whole issue of food and this, its sustainability. Uh, it's important to acknowledge that uh, this year a food system summit will take place, but that's only the sixth such summit in the last 80 years. People probably don't realise how sel seldom something like this happens. And, and it's probably never happened at a more critical time. It, it has, it's also it's recognising that food is in a more complex area than ever before. I mean, in the past, f World f Food Summits were really devoted to looking at what to do about people who risk being hungry. This now recognises that food is a, more is, a, is a more complex area. Food has to not only produce food, for, the sector has to produce food for, for people to eat, but it also has to do it in a sustainable way so that we can achieve our climate and environmental goals. And it also has to acknowledge the fact that food is directly related to health. In the last 20 years in particular, we've moved to uh, what is if you like, an epidemic of overweight and obesity at the global level. And that's leading on to a, a huge rise in non-communicable non diseases like diabetes, heart disease, etc., etc., and with enormous implications down the road for public health and public, health, public finances. So we're beginning to look at food in its wider context 
And that's the context, I think, that we, we, we see that the Food System Summit is important. And we see that Ireland has a particular opportunity to play a critical role there. And that's certainly helped by the fact that in our own domestic policy in the 2030 Food System Strategy, we've attempted to frame our future on the basis of sustainable food systems. OK, and it's interesting, seeing as how um, you raised that point about Ireland's role there, I'd, I'd like to bring you in, uh, Michelle, because I was struck in our keynote speakers. And, you know, while we, we have a ways to go, and Susanna was talking about uh, our peer review, uh, I was struck by what our, uh, Jamie was saying about Ireland's leadership role. So from your point of view, given the work that you do, and I have another Slido poll question for you, so that's coming up in a second. But just if you tell us at this stage about the potential of that leadership role? Um, thank you. I, I think um, I'll start by saying, you know, our international development policy, A Better World, places an emphasis on reaching what we call the furthest behind first. And I think that really focuses attention on food systems and, and indeed food security. It, it's important to bear in mind that effectively every single one of the sustainable development goals relies on a sustainable food system. So if we, do, if we don't crack this particular challenge now, we never will. There are only nine harvests to 2030, as, as somebody pointed out in one of the previous dialogues. Ireland has um, been very consistent on, on the leadership around food and championing of food. But I think in addition to our experience and our intellectual leadership on this, we do have a moral leadership. I think, um, I think the president mentioned at the weekend the sense of, of moral outrage around hunger that the majority of Irish people have. Most Irish people can speak to the experience of hunger on society, on our economy and, and so on. And I think that does give us a degree of legitimacy. Um, and, and I think everybody recognises that we're not where we need to be at the moment. You know, we have this great opportunity this year, but the clock is really ticking. Um, so really, you know, we have the policy framework, we have the experience, but importantly, we have that public support. And, and I think the government feels very strongly that we should be capitalising on that and, and, and mobilising that um, in this particular uh, set of conversations that will happen this year. And it's interesting that point you make about public support. Before we go any further, let me give you another Slido, Slido poll. What aspects of Ireland's agri-food experience could be of most interest and benefit to developing countries? Is it our grassland farming systems? Is it food safety and traceability? Is it approaches to farming cooperatives? Is it research and extension systems? Or is it accessing international markets? And, you know, trade is such a huge part of all of this. It would be interesting to hear uh, what you say on that. Oh, and from your point of view, I mean, Devonish exporting to more than 50 countries, the role that private business plays here, what role can you make? What contribution can you make? Thank you. Uh, the... Business, by definition, is focused primarily on delivering solutions. Uh, and we're all clear about the problems and the challenges. But uh, as has been mentioned by previous speakers, the clock is ticking. Uh, and that focus has to very much become, how do we solve problems? And I would say, first and foremost, that's what business is good at doing at scale, uh, quickly, uh, and probably most important of all, affordably. And that's what you think. And also, I was wondering about when the priority being about, you know, so many people thinking it was important to help small holders. What are the, what's the role of companies like yourselves? You know, this could come out of the summit as one of the, you know, the aims and another goal that we're all setting for ourselves. You say your solutions focused. What kind of solutions might be possible in that area? Well, one of the most important and we find generally underestimated uh, is in the area of know-how. And there's a lovely expression about that that uh, says, everything is simple when you know how. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, know-how uh, is a huge issue. If you haven't had the opportunity from an educational point of view, if you don't have the resources uh, to apply, uh, know-how can be in short supply. 
Uh, so I think closing that know-how gap uh, is, is um, uh, first on my list. Uh, and in our own case, uh, we engage with about 200,000 smallholder farmers in Kenya. And it is really instructive to see up close uh, where those know-how gaps are, and also to see, encouragingly, uh, the very great difference it can make very quickly when those gaps get closed. So one of the things that uh, we're very focused on uh, is the opportunity in all of this. Uh, there's a great deal to be done, but there's actually a great capability mm -hmm. to deliver big solutions quickly. Uh, and I don't want to remotely claim that uh, COVID could ever be a good thing, uh, but it's the first time in my life I have seen a challenge uh, at that level globally. Uh, and it's been hugely impressive to see how whole of society has mobilized to confront that challenge uh, and to be uh, one year later uh, looking at a situation where global scale solutions which are affordable are being delivered. Uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, and on that one, uh, I would say uh, the role of science uh, probably has been the, the biggest standout for me. Uh, we have huge amounts of really uh, world-leading science uh, being delivered day and daily. Perhaps pre-COVID, we didn't always have sufficient respect for what it was that science could accomplish or maybe even more than uh, respect, uh, perhaps not always the sense of urgency uh, around dealing with difficult issues. Uh, and I hope and expect one of the lessons to come out of COVID is going to be uh, an increased focus on stepping into difficult problems before they come to bite us. That's fascinating, and I'll come back to you uh, to ask you more about Kenya. Uh, and interesting as, as well, the way you talk about the pandemic, because obviously the issue with these marvellous vaccines that have been event invented now and are being produced at scale and are affordable is, of course, the whole is issue of equity of access and the World Health Organization uh, talking about that as well. And that's obviously, you know, very much part of the theme of what we're talking about today. Uh, Charlie, maybe you talk to me about your perspective on Ireland and the, the leadership role that, that we can, can play? Where are sure. the gaps? What, what, what are we doing right and where are the gaps? Like for, firstly, we're doing lots of things right. We're, 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 you know, we're an agri-food nation. We have been for, for decades. And you know, the, the leadership of Irish Aid in terms of the focus on you know, the leaving no one behind, reaching the furthest behind, like a, a pro-poor you know, focus on relation to our development activities. It certainly stands out on, on the international stage. And so if we look at sustainable food systems, I guess the challenge for us is to, is to ask ourselves, do, do the claims of sustainability, um, do they stand up to scrutiny? Because if we don't scrutinize our sustainability claims, then others will. Then I suppose on one hand, we have to consider what's happening with our, with our overseas partners. Um, if we look at Africa, Africa will have 2.5 billion people um, by 2050, about one in 10 of those will be in extreme poverty uh, if things continue as they are, and that'll be 90% of the world's extreme poor. So the sustainable food systems, you know, that are, need, that are needed to meet the needs of the extreme poor on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we have the, the, the health outcomes associated with obesity. These, these, are, these are somewhat, we're going to have to tailor these um, in different directions. It's, there is no one size fits all. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of claims or efforts around, you know, making transformations of our food systems, but we have to realize that our food systems um, are, we're building from the ones that we have right now. So we can make incremental changes to the ones we have now, but there are calls for transformational changes, which may be much more difficult to achieve. And for transformational changes to occur, that may mean changing our farming systems, our consumption patterns, and these, these are difficult and they're also risky. And we, we, we do need dialogue um, between differing stakeholders who, who really may not have been on the same 
map, let's say, um, in terms of where we want to get to, even though everybody agrees where we want to get to, how to get there is contested. And within the Irish Forum for International Agricultural Development, we've brought together differing um, stakeholder institutions and we're, and we're working you know, together to see you know, where, where our differences are, where we have commonalities and to, and to see what can be done together. And I think we have to have such processes if we want to build consensus. OK, there's a lot that's, that's in there and I'll come back to you on, on some of those points. Um, but I wanted to pick up uh, on that point Charlie was making about Africa and population growth and the challenge. I mean, not just, you know, you've described the problems we've got already in terms of hunger and poverty and, you know, where we were even before the pandemic and now worse. But add the pop projected population growth in Africa on top of that. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as if this isn't a daunting task, this summit in the autumn, is it? Well, Africa is, in a sense, at the, in the cockpit of these challenges going forward. Uh, between now and 2050, world population is due to increase by about 2 billion, from a, just below 8 billion now to just below 10 billion in 30 years' time. Three quarters of that population increase will happen in Africa. That's the statistic that not generally known, but it is, that is That's the case. That's some number, isn't it? It is a huge number. And it also just reflects the development challenges that Africa is, is faced with. There will be, over that same period, an additional 800 million people coming into the African workforce. That means Africa has to create, on average, 27 million new jobs per year. That's a staggering in increase. And what that really means uh, has profound implications for the agri-sector and the rural sector of Africa. And uh, if Africa is to achieve the sort of development success that it, it needs to do in order to create those jobs, it's going to have to be based in the first instance on development of the agri-food and rural sector. And that's where I think Ireland has a real role to play, building on its, its, its tradition over the many years of um, you know, working on a development basis with Africa. Now we're moving into a different space, and that's where the relevance of sustainable food systems come into play. Jamie was very interesting to say, to, to reflect on how, um, uh, when there was this meeting in two, two and a half, nearly three years ago now, with 11 African countries and subsequently at a meeting in, in Rwanda in, in 2019, a very great interest uh, on, the, on behalf of African countries in how Ireland had developed its own sector, its own economy, its, particularly its own uh, agri-food system. And I think their interest was that they could see relevance in the Irish model. Yeah. It's not that Ireland is com was coming to Africa and saying, look, this is how to do it. Not at all. That's not where you start from. You start from a very honest examination of where you're starting from in Africa. As the great John Hume used to say about Irish politics, you start from where you are. And, but they also found that uh, there, there were many aspects of the Irish experience which could be relevant to the African experience. And that's really the perspective that is needed to be... So it's the point that, that Owen was making, because traditionally, you know, people think in, in terms of, you know, development and, and you, you know, a lot of it, the origins were, was a lot of the interest here, we, you know, would be in the charitable sector. Yeah. But now, actually, what Africa wants is know-how, the kind of know-how yeah. that's been developed in our agri-food se sector here. There's going to be a huge increase in African demand for food over the next 30 years because of population increase and the income increase. Now, what Africa needs to do is make sure that Africa itself supplies a great part of that additional demand. And that's where the whole imperative to get more effective change at the level of the, of, of the food systems in Africa has to take place. And that's about... It's about setting a policy framework which encourages that to happen. It's about setting, dealing with short-term problems, and there are many short-term problems, but it's also about putting down the, the long-term basis for development. That's about infra institutions, etc. And it's that in those areas of policy and institutions that I think Ireland has a really mm -hmm. important role to play. 
Um, it's interesting in the light of this, the results of that Slido poll, the aspects of Ireland's agri-food experience that could be of most interest and benefit to developing countries. Uh, the vast majority saying approaches to farming cooperatives could be of most interest and benefit to developing countries. Uh, second place, research and extension systems. And Charlie, uh, based on the experience that you have had uh, in dialogue with uh, African nations coming together. What do you make of those Slido poll results? Uh, to, to me, to me they, they, make, they make sense, you know, it's because, like if we consider, well, firstly, we, you know, our approach to, to working with other countries has to be a partnership-based approach. And, you know, every, every African country has its, um, every country basically has its national economic plan, agricultural plan, um, its national adaptation plan. So, so my, I guess we have to work in a manner in partnership with, um, with our country partners to ensure that we're working in tandem and in synergy with them and not at, not at cross purposes. And in some sense, we, we, have, we have three three kind of spheres of engagement. We have our overseas development assistance uh, engagement, which, which may speak to reaching the furthest behind. And then we have our exports, which may speak to a, a different aspect of food security, if you may. And then we also have foreign direct investment, which may, may speak to the question of where, where the jobs going to be generated in rural areas in Africa, which it's, it's quite difficult to generate jobs in rural areas in Ireland. So uh, even more challenging in Africa. So I think there is a policy coherence question here where we really need to foster more dialogue um, across departments. And, and as, as Suzanne indicated, the intergenerational piece is important, but we also have to, to work yeah. with our partners to see if our activities are really uh, in synergy um, with other nations that we consider to be in partnership with. And that's interesting, isn't it? That point Susanna was making, Michelle, about policy coherence. Because again, um, you know, while there's a lot of uh, support for Ireland's foreign aid policies and the work that has gone on, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, translating that into making sure that what you're doing in trade, what you're doing in terms of investment, what you're doing in terms of, you know, the profits you're looking after for yourself in your own country, uh, it means you've got to say, no, hang on, how are these all interlinked? And that's a, that's another level entirely. Again, do you think we're making that shift in the run up to the, this autumn? I think we're certainly making an effort in that direction. Um, I mean, Susanna was right that, that one of the findings of the OECD DAC peer review was, was that this was something that we needed to address. Um, we have worked hard, certainly, at, at engaging right across government on our international obje development objectives. A better world is not a Department of Foreign Affairs policy. It's a government policy, and, and all of the various government departments have signed up to and, and we're engaged in its, um, in its development. So we, we have um, breathed new life into what we call the Interdepartmental Committee on International Development. And that is a forum really now where we thrash out some of these issues, where we know we have elements of incoherence and, and we, we really kind of work on that. I think also um, the point that, that Charlie makes about the, the, the knowledge that we're transferring and making sure it's appropriate, that's something I think we take very seriously as well. We are not necessarily trying to tell the world that you should do things the way we do them. I think we are honest. Because the road to hell has been paved with good intentions indeed, in that regard. Indeed. And there are lots of examples, exactly. aren't there, all over Africa. Exactly. Yes. And, and we recognise we have learning to do. I mean, these dialogues have demonstrated that we have learning to do. Um, what I'm seeing is that a lot of the engagement we have, let's say, with African partners is, is very much around how we do things, how we place the smallholder farmer at the centre of our work, how we work with cooperatives, how private sector, civil society, government come together. But um, we're learning from them too. You know, there are many, many areas of great policy innovation happening in Africa that we could do well to reflect on as we deepen our own understanding of food systems and, and address some of these thorny challenges, like Charlie mentioned, the, um, the, the problem of rural employment. We don't have all the answers. And I think that humility um, and a, a fluidity and an open conversation within government and indeed with our civil society research and so on partners um, is at least a first step to addressing areas of policy incoherence okay. anyway. Oh, and talk to me uh, more about the, the know-how, the sharing of know-how. Talk to me about how that's been working. Well, given uh, current circumstances, uh, perhaps a good place to start with, unsurprisingly, 
uh, is the role of uh, vaccines, uh, in this case, uh, around animal production. Yeah. Uh, and the ability of uh, innovation of that type uh, to have uh, a, a very rapid uh, transformative effect on uh, production in locations like Kenya, like Uganda, Ethiopia and others. So the innovation agenda, um, and if uh, uh, I could take it a little further, many of those innovations, once they become established, uh, I think we've constantly to remind ourselves, get taken for granted in the locations in which they're applied. Uh, we very quickly forget what the problem looked like, uh, and therefore it uh, reduces our sense of how much could be accomplished if those technologies, that know-how, was made more universally applicable. And you mentioned that in your earlier comment about uh, one of the challenges we're unsurprisingly currently facing is the issue of global equity. But as against that challenge, uh, hasn't COVID brought home, in a way certainly I've never seen before, how globally connected we mm -hmm. all are? Uh, and that actually a problem for one uh, is either directly a problem for all or has the potential to so become, and very rapidly. So I think self-interest is also important to call out. It is in everybody's self-interest. doesn't matter what sector, what geography, what station of life. Uh, there is just uh, a huge... Uh, self-interest uh, in focusing on and delivering with a sense of urgency solutions to these problems because somebody else's problem today uh, can very very quickly become our problem tomorrow yeah and, and it's I, actually gas isn't it the, uh, at the moment you know there's a shortage of uh, Cadbury's flakes in Ireland they're produced in Egypt you know again there are all these kinds of we're suddenly much more aware of supply lines we're suddenly much more aware of you know something we think was produced down the road it's not actually produced down the road uh, anymore Charlie I, I'd like to bring you in on this because I was interested actually uh, in the re uh, in Susanna's reference to citizens assemblies because I know, and we've been getting this theme in, you know, it's all about, you know, helping the small farmers and rural communities and, uh, and all of that. Uh, but what was key when we were having the discussion about rural communities here in Ireland uh, and trying to, if you like, get through the, you know, change and more sustainable change there, what was key was the way the people communicate with people. What was key was getting local buy-in from the ground up. So things like citizens' assemblies, things like local education and, uh, and discussion and networks, how important are all of they and, and, and what experience do you think we could bring to the table? Yeah, th these are all really critical. Like the, the innovations that, that are necessary for these transformations of our food systems are not only technical, they're also social and so social innovations. And, and with social innovation, like if we consider innovators innovators exist everywhere in society it's not just those in universities uh, if you're poor there are poor people who are who are innovators in fact it, arguably it could be considered that it, you need to be more of an innovator to live in a, in a poverty situation and so for that reason we really do need like it's it's interesting that the audience point towards the, the role of cooperatives empowerment and social capital building exercises that that enable uh, representation of people and people to chart their own destiny and in that sense you know we should be careful about you know exporting our own you know our best intended sort of views of what we think should be solutions for others when in fact they may know what the solutions are themselves and in fact just need assistance in identifying them and mobilizing the resources to achieve them. Uh, we've had a question in from our audience, Tom. Ireland shouldn't use environmentally unsustainable intensive systems to grow food for export. This is globally unsustainable. I suppose that's, you know, this is part of the, the, the question about, you know, how much are we living up to the very noble aims that we're setting ourselves in our development policy when, for instance, we look at the way we're producing food ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> Nobody should claim that we're perfect at the moment we're not um, there needs to be more progress made on the way in which we 
environmentally uh, produce food. Uh, that's at the heart of the 2030 strategy. Uh, but equally, uh, at the heart of the 2030 strategy is the fact that there needs indeed to be a balance between environmental, economic and social sustainability. So I think that's the challenge we face. But I think in broad terms, uh, I mean, Ireland is not, if it's attempting to talk to other countries about sustainable food production, it's going to actually firstly listen to them as to where they're starting from and what they want to achieve. Uh, what they will want to achieve, by and large, is a capacity to increase their food production, uh, to satisfy their own needs in the first instance, and in the second instance, to maybe satisfy, uh, on a regional basis, uh, Africa's needs. It's only really at a third and later stage they should be looking at international yeah. markets. But there has to be, I think, a, a really serious partnership based on mutual respect, based on sound planning, between Africa does need assistance in this regard. And I mean, the likes of Owens, Owens Company, Devonish, are, are just one example of how that assistance can also take place. I mean, the whole I role love of the that idea of sharing know-how. The yeah. Absolutely, the private sector, uh, and many, most African countries fully accept this at this stage. The private sector has an important role to play in their future development. Yes, and in fact, a lot of the really brilliant development work uh, yeah. that has happened in Africa in terms of the empowerment of women has yeah. been about giving them the means to earn money for themselves and earn money for their families, which has been fantastic. I mean, putting women and smallholder farming at the centre of uh, strategy in most African countries is absolutely the right way to go. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm allowed. To, I'm not usually allowed to express an opinion, but I'll express that one. But as, as well, you know, I mean, these are tough challenges. There, there, there's no doubt about that, Michelle. You know, it'd be easy to sit around and just, you know, say lots of noble things, but actually delivering on this is not going to be easy. And as you say, only nine harvests to 2030. And within that, we've already spoken about the pandemic. But again, I was I was really struck when when Rory spoke about the locust because again, that's a consequence of, you know, global warning, of, of rainfall in the de desert, so you're getting these, you know, locust populations and at a size and we've never seen before and so on, and the impact they, they have had uh, didn't get as much attention probably as, as it deserved. But this is the reality of the world we live in now, so besides trying to climb that mountain, we're also going to be having to take, you know, avalanches raining down on top of us. Yeah. I, I think um, I, I totally agree. I, you, you know, I'd like to bring us back to hunger for a moment. I mean, hunger doesn't happen as a result of a, of a neat sequence of events. It's often a series of really compli complex interrelated events that, that, that happen. And, and the one thing that, that is consistent actually in, in extreme hunger crises in the world at the moment is conflict. So I was yeah. really surprised that so few people thought that conflict and pe addressing conflict and peace building was a, was a game changing solution. In fact, we are quite focused on that and on that relationship between conflict and hunger. So, so conflict doesn't necessarily create hunger, but what it can do is exacerbate climate vulnerability, um, you know, weakness due to, let's say, a death in the family or indeed a collapse in markets or something. So we're, we're really um, looking for ways to try to address that. As you probably know, we're on the UN Security Council at the moment and um, really taking that opportunity to call that out and, and, and signal where we see a, an injustice based on conflict. Um, and in fact, when the Food Systems Summit happens in September, we will hold the presidency of the UN Security Council. Oh, I so, wasn't aware of that. Right. Yeah, so we'll be really um, focusing efforts. We've been working really closely with Niger on the monitoring of what we call Security Council Resolution 2417, which really just looks at that dynamic and what we can do. Peace building is also really important. Ireland has an unbroken record of peacekeeping troops at the UN for 60 years. And, and again, that's an area where we do have a degree of moral authority. So we'll really be trying to, 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 to force the issue there, but recognising again that it's not as simple as, you know, a ceasefire and then hunger goes away. You know, we know there are lots of yeah. interlocking uh, factors.
But again, you know, our defence forces and the experience they've gained in that peacekeeping, that's a real example of the know-how that's been able exactly. to be translated and shared in so many situations. Oh, and one of our Slido questions uh, is saying one proposed game-changing solution for the Food System Summit is the End Hunger Fund. And our questioner says the concept is that private business would donate $5 billion to this targeted fund. Um, I'm not asking you to come up with the five billion now, but what's your comment on that? And, the, and you know, the role of the five private sector in coming up with a, a, a sum that big? Uh, the private sector is uh, doing in that regard uh, a lot more than is uh, generally realised. And one of the terms that's applied to this is um, the concept of philanthropic giving. Uh, so I think it's useful to uh, consider just how much uh, has changed in the last 10 or 15 years in terms of the initiatives being taken by sometimes uh, very prominent people uh, to apply uh, what for me are uh, mind-bending sums of money on global problems. Uh, and when we stop to reflect, we'll all be able to uh, call out uh, prominent uh, examples of that. One of the effects that's having uh, is uh, demonstrating what can be done uh, and the trend in that area is sharply up uh, and a further thing that's happening is that this is all being formalized uh, for business uh, as for society uh, in the legal and financial frameworks around what's described as the ESG governance agenda, environmental, social and governance. And one of the things that, uh, again back to COVID, uh, that I found very motivating was the sense that uh, many people had been concerned that COVID would derail the ESG agenda. The finding in fact is that COVID has accelerated the ESG agenda and actually has uh, extended the ESG agenda for many people uh, for whom it's now become an ESG H agenda, the H being a focus on human health. So uh, I think sometimes it's... And why do you think that is? Simply that the fact of the pandemic has reminded us all of our interdependence? Uh, but also uh, how it brought to light things of which we were already aware, but perhaps had not connected. Uh, Tom made reference, for example, and other speakers have made reference to the challenge of obesity. And suddenly we discover that people who are obese have far worse outcomes yeah. uh, in a COVID challenge. People who are vitamin D deficient, people who are omega-3 deficient. Uh, and you can sum all of that up by saying uh, it brings under a spotlight something which we've been aware of at a high level for a long time, how important good quality food, uh, uh, a role it can play in promoting good health and preventing ill health. So I think we've now uh, crossed a Rubicon which says we cannot continue down a path of simply treating people when they become sick. We've got to put far more focus on uh, preventing people getting into that position. And with that focus, a consideration of just how much potential there is in that and the role of food uh, in delivering that. And even where people do fall, you know, I mean, illness may be inevitable, but the healthier you are, the better you're going to cope. Uh, Charlie, there's a question that's come in and maybe in answering it, uh, you'd also talk to us about the work you've been doing with the National Task Team on rural Africa. And the question is, how can we ensure that global food system dialogues include the voices of smallholders and experts in agricultural sectors from across Africa? Is that happening? Is it not happening enough? How do we make more happen? Um, it, it, it is happening, but like there's there's lots of there's lots of activity happening, um, you know, in this space in Ireland and internationally. That the NTTRA process, the National Task Team for Rural Africa process, was a really valuable process, which helped us really to to map out. It was, it was led by by Tom and others, and it helped us to to map out what are the activities in Ireland, both on the university sector, Chagas, uh, the the companies. Trade with trade with our African partners to get a to get a snapshot of what that is and and there's a lot of disparate activities and 
some, the recommendations of the NTTRA, there, there's there's a range of recommendations about better advice, advisory services, supports to businesses who want to engage with African partners, um, both for trade reasons, but also for development outcome reasons, and also for a more Ireland Inc. approach, I suppose, to um, to our engagement with our with our African partners. There, there are lots of forums, um, both within the United Nations systems, within, we, we, we work a lot with the CGIR system, as an example, it's a research um, system globally, and, and within the European Union. The European Union, like the, just this week, um, Ursula van der Leyen has indicated that, you know, the green, greening back better for, for, for the African subcontinent um, and for the African Union is something, is it an area um, of, of interaction, interaction between the European Union and Africa. So there's, there's lots of opportunities for voice, but I, I think that Irish Aid plays a particular role in, in giving voice to those that don't have voice and, and supporting organizations to get them to the table, whether that's in the climate change negotiations, which in COP26 coming up in, uh, the, at the end of this year, or any other types of fora where we can, and there's possible to get the voices of those who don't have that usually a voice at the table. So I think, I think we are doing a, like a, a pretty good job in that respect. And as a final comment then, Tom, um, you spend a lot of time in committee rooms these days, you know, trying to pull all these threads together. Um, and you've also spent so much of your life on the ground in Africa. So that challenging challenge of turning, you know, bringing the consensus together and also turning all these fine words into changes that actually make a difference on the ground in the place you care about so much. Do you think... Well, you wouldn't think it's hopeless. You wouldn't be doing it otherwise. But um, how confident are you we can make a difference? Well, what I am clear about is that this year and the Food System Summit represents a huge opportunity to at least go in the right direction and try and get commitments to achieve things. At the end of the day, it's going to come down, in, in Africa's case, to... Uh, the efforts of Africa's own governments and citizens, uh, how well this will succeed. I'm very glad in the next uh, panel you'll have Usman, who you, you will find is a person of great authority and he, he will, I think, give, be able to answer that question better than I am. But it is the, the moment is that we have to take this opportunity of this year to see can we chart the future and commit people to making sure that future is better than the present. Okay, and I look forward to talking to you again, Tom, uh, in the next couple of months as we move along the way. Tom, Michelle, Owen, Charlie, uh, thank you all. It's been my pleasure to talk to you uh, for this panel. I wish I could stay talking to you for longer, but we've a lot more to do uh, this afternoon. And as the agri-food strategy nears completion now, and as preparations are going ahead for that food system summit, uh, as I said, I'm going to be sitting down again with Tom, who's our special envoy in food systems. That's going to be sometime in the next couple of weeks, hopefully early summer and we're going to try and pull to get together the threads of this national series of dialogues and discuss in more detail then the key themes and priorities emerging in the run-up to that summit and don't forget as I reminded you earlier all the dialogues are available on YouTube so if you want to go back and it, it, it's really interesting the way some of the themes uh, from those earlier discussions have been cropping up again today and um, what makes us healthy all of that and um, so uh, all of that available on YouTube we have another Slido question for you now and this will be feeding into our next panel discussion and please keep the comments uh, and your responses coming in what is the most significant global challenge we face in providing food security for all by 2030? Is it the population growth that we've been hearing about? Or is it the climate change and biodiversity crisis? We all know about that. Food loss and food waste? Consolidation of corporate power? Or conflict? Again, these are all themes that were brought up in our panel discussion. And we're going to be hearing more of them now with our second panel. And let me introduce our second panel to you. Dr. Usman Badian is Distinguished Fellow of the African Association of Agricultural Economists. He's a former winner of the Africa Food Prize, a member of the World Academy of Sciences, and he's the founder and executive director of Academia 2063, and we're looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, Osman joins us remotely. Also with us remotely, Fanula Gilsonen, who's Ireland's ambassador to South Africa at the moment. Plenty of experience in Africa. We'll be hearing about that from her.
David Butler is Director of the Sustainable Food Systems Ireland. That's a consortium of the Irish government's largest agri-food organisations. He's here with me. And Quiva de Barra is the Chief Executive of Throkra, the Irish charity that's challenging poverty and injustice in the developing world. And let's show our panel now what you thought in answer to our fourth Slido question. Do we have that up yet? I'll be bringing that to you in, in just a second. Usman, I want to go to you first while we're waiting for the results of that Slido poll to come in. Uh, Usman, you know, we've been hearing a lot about Ireland and, and our experience, but from your extensive experience, uh, Usman, if you're still with us, would you tell us what you want from Ireland this September and what you want from the EU? Thank you very much uh, for that question and thank you for having me. Uh, I think um, what we would want to see the summit achieve, and that is what we would like to see uh, Ireland, the EU and others uh, work towards making sure we get that outcome, uh, is that we indeed leave this summit with greater focus and attention to the challenges, uh, but also a greater uh, commitments and partnership uh, to meet uh, the goals that we all agreed to work towards. Uh, I hope that uh, Ireland, the EU, and other participants will make sure that we uh, come out with realistic ambitions uh, that allow us uh, to address the challenges on the ground uh, and that we also come up with a uh, summit uh, that aligns with and supports uh, the agenda of African countries from the Agenda 2063 to the Malabo Declaration in Agriculture, which has a series of uh, the same goals, uh, but provide a framework uh, for local uh, um, uh, interventions, which uh, provides a framework for holding governments accountable, which provides a framework for including the private sector and civil society organizations. Why it's going to be very difficult, and why I hope that I and others pay attention, is that, that this should not become a summit of ideologies and uh, very strongly held convictions. It should be a summit rooted in evidence uh, that can guide action that has chances to succeed and can be scalable at the local level. It also be a summit that respects and reflects the diversity of the realities of the challenges of food systems. Yes, food systems have all the same segments, but the same segments have different ways and different challenges in different geographies. So not coming therefore with a prescriptive outcome and rather with shared targets and goals and rules that will allow individual geographies to adjust those uh, to their own realities and make progress as we move forward. Thank you. So what's really, really key for you is, is, is that it's not a summit of ideologies and it comes up with solutions that are practical and locally applicable. Uh, talk to us about 2063, why that matters. Tell us what Academia 2063 is. Uh, thank you very much. Academia 2063 is a, uh, an international, in the sense of Africa-wide, um, think tank. Uh, with headquarters in Kigali and Rwanda and a regional uh, office in Dakar, Senegal. We are about 30 of us working across the continent. What makes us different is that we zero in on helping African countries to access the data and the analytics to successfully implement the vision of Agenda 2063, which is the Africa that we all want. Uh, it was in a 50-year period back in 2013 which goes, of course, first with ending the issue of hunger and poverty, but also transforming African economies and creating prosperity. As Tom was saying, it is government action, the quality of policies that is much more determining than anything else. But getting the data and the analytics to support governments to improve their policies as they go forward is extremely important. We know and we hope that the summit will pay attention to that, that um, low productivity in Africa's agriculture and Africa's value chains are a big driver of poverty and hunger. So looking for solutions, therefore, moving forward, will have to bring in several elements. 
uh, that all could converge towards sustainable intensification. That's extremely important. Science and technology systems and innovations to bring out new technologies that can be adapted and adapted by the farmers. We need a whole focus on skills. Uh, driving a tractor is not like driving a bicycle. Uh, the processing sector, which is not the most important segment of the food systems, requires the technology, the skills for process innovation, for product innovations. We talk about youth, they need the skills to gain fully engaged in agriculture. Agriculture is a job, it's a profession that needs to be learned. So skills for youth is going to be extremely important. So I think that um, as we move towards uh, the seminars outcome, the journey in Africa and going back to Agenda 2063, a transformed Africa means Africa where rural spaces are livable. And that's where the summit can contribute as well. We focus a lot on productive assets, but social assets in the rural areas, access to social services are important for productivity and for uh, gainful businesses. Access to infrastructure, we focus quite a lot, but are we doing enough in the rural areas? Until and unless the rural areas are livable for businesses and poor people and farmers, it's going to be extremely difficult to achieve advances in the food system. And I think that's a um, specificity of Africa that the Sambi needs to pay attention to. And we look at productivity as a drive of livelihoods to end chronic vulnerability and move the agenda forward. Fortunately, there have been some good movement in the last 20 years in Africa. We can build on that and hopefully that experience will transpire in the summit. Thank you. Thank you. And that's really interesting, that point about sustainable, sustainable intensification uh, that you raise, particularly in the context of the hunger challenge. And just to let you know what our audience watching panel think is the most significant global challenge in providing food security by all, for all by 2030 and by, by a large majority, 56 percent say it's climate change and the biodiversity crisis, population growth 15%, food loss and food waste 88%, consolidation of corporate power at 12%, conflict still quite low at 10%. And Quiva, maybe because again, the, given you know what we've heard about the, the challenge of population growth, the challenge of feeding that population uh, in Africa, and also at the same time meeting the climate change and biodiversity crisis. Um, what Usman was saying about not going into the UN summit, you know, with an over ideological bias, but coming up with practical solutions. But it is an enormous challenge, isn't it, to sustainably meet the hunger and poverty crisis that exists and will grow, and at the same time, mind the environment. From your point of view, what are the key points Ireland should be bringing with us as we go into the summit in September? Thank you, Anya, and thank you very much to the previous speakers. I think actually a lot of the key factors have already been mentioned, but maybe I'll just underscore a few that I think are really fundamental. So one is the one that was mentioned by Michelle Winthrop, which is conflict. Um, the reality is that two thirds of the um, extreme poor will live in fragile and conflict affected states by 2030. So within 10 years, 66% of the people who are the furthest behind are living in contexts that are fragile. And that fragility is driven typically by conflict and climate change and often a combination of both. And also by unstable politics and governance crises or human rights violations issues. So I think what's really important is that we do treat this as a complex inter section of a, a range of different issues. But that is not to say that there are not solutions and that those solutions cannot be built from the bottom up. They definitely can. But I think one thing that hasn't maybe been mentioned before, so I'll just bring it into the table, is that we need to ground this in the reality of the lived reality of people where they are now and who are the most vulnerable. So the most vulnerable are not a homogenous group. You may have in some countries, in some contexts, the most vulnerable may be landless people, maybe people living in urban areas. It will always include women, it will always include young people, it will always include people living with disabilities, it will always include people who are suffering from chronic health conditions. But within that as well, you know, you need to look at the subgroups, which will include pregnant and lactating mothers, teenage girls, children, people living with HIV. So we need to just ground what we're talking about in the reality of that affect people who are affected by chronic or acute food insecurity are 
are, are suffering or are living through and then build the solutions up from there. So one way that I think is very useful to look at that is to say, OK, well, this has to be addressed through a human rights lens, because otherwise you can quickly come to a position where you're talking about science, markets, food as a commodity and actually forget that food is a right, food is a basic human right and that many people really struggle in terms of their access to food and their struggle could be as a result of their status in society which leaves them marginalised and poor, it could be due to the fact that they don't have the assets that are required in order to help them either to produce food or to access food. So building it up means that a full systems approach looks at where is a person placed? Where are they in the community? What power do they have? What access and control over resources do they have? Where are the investments from government and from donors and from other institutions going? And are they actually targeting the needs of the most vulnerable? And this is an area where I do think Ireland can and should show leadership um, and speak maybe more strongly about, which is the practices that we have developed working in partnership with many governments over many years of focusing on well, what does it really mean to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest behind first? And then you will definitely reach a point where you're saying those who are furthest behind are the people who are most acutely affected by climate and conflict and extreme poverty. And then you will start talking about the things that scored very low on those lists, like conflict and also like social protection, which has a huge role to play in helping people to address chronic poverty. They scored so low. Were you surprised at that, Quiva, that they scored so low? I was very surprised, but I do think as well at the same time, we've got to understand that often when you answer these polls, you know, you're, you're, you're choosing between things that are indivisible and you're just trying to give some level of prioritisation. In fact, conflict, yeah. chronic poverty, acute poverty, they, they, they're not indivisible. They mutually reinforce each other, often in negative downward spirals. Absolutely. And actually, in bearing that in mind, I'm going to give you another Slido poll question now. The Sustainable Development Goals 2, they aim to achieve zero hunger by 2030. And as Michelle was telling us earlier, we're way off uh, on that at the moment and nine harvests to go. So what is the most important factor, in your opinion, in securing a world free from hunger and malnutrition? Is it new technologies for agriculture? Is it support to primary producers? Is it climate change adaptation? Is it a global shift to healthy diets? Or is it zero food loss and waste? Um, I want to come to you now, Fanula, on the basis, of, as I say, ambassador to South Africa, but you've been working in Africa for many years now. So we heard from Moosman about what he wants from countries like Ireland. What's your sense about how our relationship with Africa, with our notions of development and trade and food, how all that has been changing? Well, I think we're at a kind of a, a, an interesting point where many of the things that those of us have been engaged in development for many decades are seeing now very much coming into the mainstream. So that's quite unusual, if you like, where people are talking about holistic food systems, they're talking about environmental, environmental, social and governance issues um, within that system and uh, emphasising the importance of all of those elements. Uh, so that's a real opportunity, I, I, I think. But what we have to remember is that at the centre of all of these systems are uh, primary producers, smallholder farmers, and uh, many of them, as Quiva mentioned, um, are women. And these people are very often the, the, the recipients, if you like, of various policies that seem to be the latest and best new thing. And when uh, we're talking about change, I don't think that we adequately consider the legacy of what's gone before and how that has to be unwound. Um, and as a result of that, we place huge burdens on farmers uh, to essentially take on a lot of the costs of the transformation that we now think is extremely important. And I think that that's, for me, a really key element. You know, we have to begin to see this from the perspective of primary producers and the communities that uh, that they live in because if we simply uh, talk about this as a a theoretical transformation, uh, then we really risk creating further vulnerabilities for, for those people. So I think in this um, new uh, 
belief, I suppose, and not, not belief, but in this new uh, embracing of the, the consequences of climate change and the, the, the need for us to, to respond to that rapidly. We need to put the resources in place for those that are going to actually experience this change at, at the, yeah. the grassroots level. So I think that that is an extremely important element of the way in which we approach this um, this phase of, of, our, of our policy development um, and engagement. I mean, I very much, I must say, agree with, with Usman on, on the issue of productivity, because what I've seen in Africa over many um, years is a, a tendency to um, open up new areas of land, um, but not actually increase productivity. And that is, is hugely detrimental from a climate change point of view, but it also doesn't help the primary producer because they're opening up new land to the same level of, of, of underproductivity. And that has, has an enormous effect then on the, the, the degree to which they can actually create a viable economic unit and, and a sustainable livelihood for, for them and, and, and for their families. So there are some of the issues that I think we need to be thinking about as we as we move into the, to, to the food uh, summit. I think they're terrifically important points. And, and, and David, based on, on your experience at Sustainable Food Systems Ireland, that challenge uh, that Usman and uh, Fanula were talking about there of sustainable intensification and the problem of low productivity, it's a circle to be squared, isn't it? It, it is, absolutely. Um, we see, though, that there's, that there's huge scope for increasing productivity by working in the systems, by trying to strengthen systems which are in turn supporting and working directly with farmers or farmer groups. You had the, we had the reference to cooperatives earlier. Uh, you know, so so it, providing tools, providing choices for farmers and for the people that work with farmers um, is part of what we try to do in, a, in our work, in, in, in working with our counterparts in, in Africa. And, and it's instance. also about, and, uh, again, going back to the point earlier from Owen about know-how and Fanula's point about, you know, being a bit aware of the legacy. It's not just about saying, this is what we know. It's, it, it's also about listening, isn't it? it it's, it's absolutely. We don't try to bring Irish models and, and impose them and say, this is, this is, this is what you must do. We say, we, we, we show people what we have done, what has worked in our context, and then say to them, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? And they respond, and typically they will interpret uh, uh, what we are doing, and it's our job as well to help them in that translation of what, 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 what it means for us in their contexts. And then we try to support them in, in strengthening their systems, um, maybe plugging some gaps. There may be specific technologies that are directly re relevant, but mostly it's about capability. Mostly it's about helping them fill the roles that they, they potentially could fill, but aren't right now. And just picking up on the theme of governance as well, th th this is why you know governance matters. It's about auditing the way that we are going about doing our business, isn't it? And making sure as transparently as, as possible, you know, we really are asking ourselves the right questions and not just thinking we're doing a good thing. Absolutely. We're demand driven. So, so, so we respond to the, to the requests and the questions we get directly from other governments, but also from agencies, from the UN agencies, and we work closely with our colleagues in DFA and Irish Aid. So we fit into their strategic priorities, um, but we, 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 we do seek to ensure that, that what we see as good practice is also applied in the execution. Uh, and 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 that 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 so so the objectives of of sustainably Im improving productivity, of yeah. inclusivity, of getting, uh, uh, you know, addressing the obstacles that women farmers face, of getting youth in, of improving skills transfer. All of these kind of activities are what we're trying to trying to do in these kind of projects. And it's complex and it's long term and it takes, it, it, it takes a long time to, to, to change systems, to change legacy systems where there's been perhaps a history of underinvestment. Yes, exactly. And I, I want to pick up now on, on a point about the climate crisis with you, Usman. Uh, 
I want to hear you talk to us about the experience that point Fanula was making about it's important that, you know, in trying to, you know, feed the world and save the planet at the same time uh, from the effects of global warming, that we don't load too much on farmers and small producers in the front line and make them feel it's all falling down on them. So will you talk to me about those kinds of food producers in Africa and their experience of the climate crisis and how to help them deal with the problems of low productivity and the need to produce more, more sustainably. Thank you very much. Um, you know, um, we often focus on technology and access to technology like seeds and inputs. That's extremely important. But I think we have to expand the basket a little bit. Uh, I happen to believe that unless the communities where the smallholder farmers live in the rural space and in fragile areas are made much more livable, it's going to be extremely difficult for farmers to be productive the way we want it. But let's start first with the inputs. Uh, the seeds that most farmers are using are not giving them enough returns in terms of yields. Uh, there's, uh, of course, across the continent, good progress over the last 20 years. Maybe that's where I should, should start from. Uh, the last 20 years were the longest sustained period of economic growth in agricultural performance in Africa. So there's a lot that, that, that went right. We can learn from that. Right? But from there, we know that better seeds in the hands of farmers, uh, better uh, modern inputs like better fertilizers in the hands of farmers, uh, better advisory services, to use those in a way that is uh, in line with a sustainable environment and health for people and the community's environment will give us the best outcome. If you invest in those while bringing social services and COVID has shown to us that the dearth of health infrastructure and health services can be a huge problem for many communities. So uh, we, actually have seen things working on the ground, and I hope we'll be really looking at that and trying to build on that. There are working seed systems, not in many countries, but they do. In some value chains, like horticulture, you go across Africa, farmers are using modern seeds, modern fertilizers, modern inputs they are producing and are competing in the global markets and exporting to Europe. So uh, it is possible to do that. Why are we struggling in the staple sectors? The way we did better uh, policies and institutional setup in science and technology. But until and unless a farmer can make a living from the land that they are cultivating now and feed their families, they will have always to compete with the environment around them. So by making them more productive, and that's why intensification and sustainable fashion is possible, we cannot give a general rule on how to do it. But if we focus on that and look at local realities, we can get farmers to intensify, use more modern inputs in a way that spares the environment, save biodiversity, and raise productivity for them. Thank you. It's really interesting the emphasis you're putting on seed there and also on, if you like, the social and health infrastructure in rural areas and how important that's going to be uh, to sustaining communities there. Uh, just to bring you the results of our final Slido poll uh, on the aim of achieving zero hunger by 2030 and what was most, most important to you watching us about all of that. Um, New technologies for agriculture, 6%, but it's pretty, it's fairly split actually, uh, one third, one third, one quarter. Support to primary producers that we've just been talking about, 30%. Climate change adaptation, 24%. And a global shift to healthy diets, 27%. It's fascinating to hear that issue, David, isn't it, of seed and be, you know, it, it's not the first thing that springs to mind, but obviously it's critical. We're working on a potato project in, in Kenya, uh, Onya, which is with, with funding from, from the embassy, uh, Embassy of Ireland. And uh, a key point there, a potato, and what they call the Irish potato in, in, in a lot of East Africa, uh, is a brilliant crop for, for in terms of nutrition, in terms of productive, uh, productive impact. 
Um, a key issue is the access to certified or improved seeds for, for small farmers, which improves then productivity, disease resistance and so on. Um, because there are new varieties coming along all the and being bred all the time, I know uh, this well, absolutely. and they are much more disease resistant. They're the ones you want to grow. Absolutely, but you have, you have a couple of things. You have the, the behaviours, the access to, to, to seeds at the, at the farm level, you have knowledge and you have the institutional setup and there are weaknesses in all of these. We're just a, we're just a part of this project, there are other partners and private sector in this, but the, but the whole point is a variety of actions which give access to improved seeds, to better uh, extension systems, so the advisory systems, things called farmer field schools, uh, access to better inputs, and we're working also with the National um, Inspectorate Service on trying to improve and, f and, and speed up uh, the pace of seed certification, which is a key bottleneck in, 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 in slowing down access in the market to, to improve seed. So exactly what Osman was yeah. saying. Uh, so, so a combination of things, private and public, trying to get that acting together. Uh, and, 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 the, and the proof is, is, is being shown through the yields that the farmers are getting, in some cases four times improved what they previously were getting, uh, better inputs, uh, more knowledge sharing going on, and we have established a good relationship between our Department of Agriculture and the, the, the Plant Health Inspectorate yeah. with a view to working with them over an extended period of time in, in, you know, in addressing some of these bottlenecks. And Fanula and Quiva, you first, Fanula. I was fascinated to hear Rosman talk about health and also social infrastructure as being so important uh, for rural communities because those were the same themes that we heard from rural communities here in Ireland talking about their sustainability as food producers, as fish producers and so on into the future. Um, and it, sometimes these things, Fanula, they tend to get overlooked, don't they? The importance of the human supports. Yeah, I mean, I think those of us who, who maybe grew up in, in rural Ireland know, um, you know, what a difference it makes if you live in a place that's that's remote and actually doesn't have services, even things as simple as, as transport services. And it really does affect uh, your quality of life. And of course, it's no different if you live in, in rural Africa. Um, health services, education services and so on are really important. So, you know, often while, while people kind of focus quite a lot on population growth, you know, in many African countries, and, and again, it's hard to generalise because the continent is so huge, but actually, you know, in many rural areas, actually the problem is underpopulation. You know, there aren't, um, you know, you don't have that critical mass of population that allows um, for ad adequate social services and, and that's really required if, if rural um, communities are to flourish and if you're to put a stop to you know huge li labour migration into cities and um, because labour is so important um, for farming. But I also just wanted to circle back to that issue around seed and, and input because I think another really important issue is is the control of, of these inputs you know who controls yeah. the seed and I think in that potato project in, in Kenya you know, it's, it's looking at how do you maintain the control of seed uh, within the farming community rather than allowing it to be overly commercialised and, um, and to be removed then from, from the control of, of, of farmers or, or their cooperatives. And I think that that goes um, across the board for, for how... Uh, the broader governance and regulation of, of the agricultural sector and, and food systems um, operate because there is a tendency now towards a, an over concentration of ownership and control among yeah. um, certain corporations and, and that goes right through from production to distribution to consumption. So I think we have to be careful all the time not to confuse an increase in supply with uh, an increase in access to food. Uh, so making that differentiation is really at the heart of looking at regulation and governance and ensuring that control of these really critical uh, and strategic parts of the food system remains close to, to those who are actually primary producers. And that's part of the broader yeah. social infrastructure that's required in rural communities. And um, not that people should have to have money to buy seed, but they should have the, the ability to reproduce good quality and certifiable seed um, uh, and know how to do that and, and be able to maintain con control over it. So there are just some of the issues that I think maybe aren't always 
thought about when 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 we're looking at at some of these issues and it comes back a little bit to what Quiva was saying around you know this isn't just a technical issue you know it's it's also about um it's about rights and 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 it's about control for communities um over their food systems over supply and over access that's a point really well made. And I know as man was saying he doesn't want, you know, people approaching the summit with ideological solutions. But that that argument about uh, the ownership of seed and access to seeds uh, certainly usually provokes uh, quite a heated political row. Um, I have a final question for you, uh, Quiva, that's come in from our audience. And we'll finish up on this. Beyond philanthropy, how can the expertise of Ireland's private sector be leveraged in the fight against poverty and hunger? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's an excellent question because certainly there is a huge degree of expertise in Ireland. And I think it's wonderful that we are seeing so much energy going into things like the National Task Team on rural Africa. However, I would say that um, a word that Michelle used earlier really strikes me, which is the word humility which is also a trademark of Ireland's diplomacy. Like what Ireland, I've worked very closely with Irish diplomats for many years now in different countries in Africa. And what I've observed is that when Ireland is at the table, we're speaking with humility, but also authority. And the authority does come from the legitimacy of where we have come from, but it also comes from the fact that we're genuinely committed to partnership. However, at the same time, we recognize, and given our history, maybe this is no surprise, that policy around food security does not happen in a vacuum and that food security is inevitably strengthened when it's within a democratic context. So I think one of the things that Ireland needs to do, and that includes civil society, the private sector, and of course the government, is to ensure that in addressing these issues at the World Food Summit, that we are bringing those technical solutions that are appropriate to the table for people to look at and to see, okay, that could be interesting for us to learn from, but also that we continue to ensure that where challenge is required, that challenge happens. And I speak from personal experience of having seen the Irish government challenge when it was necessary to break the cycle of food insecurity in a context where the problem was not technological. It was certainly climatic, but actually it was a governance policy problem. And that's something that I would think that we should do well to bear in mind as well. While the summit should not be ideological, it should be focused on the rights of the poorest people and defending their rights and enabling their voice. It's fascinating stuff and in so many ways we've only scratched the surface but I really have appreciated you all uh, sharing your thoughts with the, us this afternoon and you at home uh, for joining in with your questions and comments and Slido responses. Quiva, Usman, Fanula, David, thank you all so very much. And that brings this afternoon's dialogue and this series of discussions almost to a close for now. But remember, you can watch all the dialogues, as I said, on YouTube and the online consultations are still open. My thanks to everyone who took part uh, in all our panels and all our keynote speakers, everyone who worked so hard behind the scenes as well to make these dialogues happen. So to conclude this afternoon, afternoon here's our chairperson, Rory de Borca. Thank you, Anya. Um, you mentioned the interest in this, and this was the second highest attendance across all four of the, of the dialogues, which I think just shows the importance of that intersection between foreign and domestic policy. And so I'd like to thank you in particular for, for your work in moderating today and, and across the, uh, the preceding dialogues. I'd also like to thank Dr. Susanna Moorhead and Dr. Jamie Morrison, all of our panellists, and all of you who put questions uh, to, the panel, uh, to the panels. Um, the effects of COVID-19 uh, over the last year have brought into sharp relief the question of well-functioning food systems that are both sustainable and equitable. Far too many people's lives are blighted by hunger and food security. And we've heard some of that today, and also we've heard how a food systems approach can go a long way to eradicating hunger and ensuring access to sustainably produced nutritious foods. Um, I'm not going to try and sum up uh, the discussion, but I want to just pull out maybe a few points that we will need to reflect on uh, as we move forward. Uh, first of all, you know, we heard about let's not be ideological, let's be practical and humble and rooted in how we move forward. We heard about the need to, you know, build social capital for change and the challenge uh, that change will bring. Um, there's a need for a joined up approach, whether that's in the state sector, whether that's um, state with with private sector with academia or Ireland and how we engage with partners uh, elsewhere. We heard about science combined with urgency uh, and how we would apply that to deliver solutions uh, 
timely solutions. There's only nine harvests left uh, to, to, to 2030 uh, and our deadline for the SDGs. And to get there, we need to build a, a process of sustainable intensification of food production. And I think in that, there's quite a bit of discussion around seeds, which was very interesting. Um, ultimately, what's, what is this about? This is about delivering better lives, healthier lives, skills and jobs for people where they live. And I think that's part of the challenge around social change and social capital against, in an African context, you know, a huge population challenge. And we heard about 27 million new jobs uh, needing to be created in Africa every year from here to 2050. That's a real challenge. Uh, and sustainable lives in the countryside and better food systems have to be part of that. Change is about, to a certain extent, unwinding the present, and that's going to be difficult. And that brings us back to that question of social capital, you know, and to understand the contexts where people live. We have to listen. We have to think about the supports that go around food, you know, infrastructure, social protection, education, health and other things. And then I think the final takeaway for me was we need to continue to ask good questions and be open to surprising answers. You know, we cannot assume knowledge. And I think these are things that we need to take forward as we think our way through to the positions that Ireland will take at the Food Systems Summit uh, in, in September and in designing our policies beyond that. So today has given us some potential pathways for optimising our leadership role as Ireland to encourage and support others to fully endorse and per se a pursue a sustainable food systems approach. I should note that in addition to these national dialogues, a range of independent dialogues have also been held in Ireland covering different aspects of sustainable food systems. So we intend to include the output from these dialogues and those other dialogues in the synthesis report that Ireland will provide directly into the UN system as part of our contribution to the summit. Before bringing this dialogue to, the, to a close, I would like to first of all thank the RDS for hosting today's event as well as the previous three dialogues so ably and generously. And to thank all of you for your active participation as we work through the complex issues we've heard today and over the preceding dialogues. A lot of people have worked very hard to put these dialogues, dialogues together, including colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs and working in very close partnership with our colleagues in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. I'd like to particularly thank Mary McCarthy, Harry O'Crowley, Paul Kiernan and Chris Somerville who put in some very long hours and made my role as chair of this particular dialogue a very easy one. Thank you very much.